Hey, my name is Dan Dunford, and uh, welcome to the very first episode of the Divergent Paths podcast. Um, This is a a project that I've been considering for the past year and a half, but it wasn't until recently that I decided to just go ahead and do it. Um, You know, I'm a big podcast listener. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are interview based, and I, you know, I'm fascinated with the the art of talking to people about the things that they're doing, Um, and and uh, you know, there's a lot of classical music podcasts. Uh, classical music adjacent podcasts and and a lot of them are broadcasts of orchestra concerts or or other types of concerts and um, a lot of talking about orchestras and and historical uh, approaches uh, talking about composers and and the like and I you know when I was looking at really starting this podcast, I went to Google and I, I typed in classical music and dead and hit search and Google spit out hundreds of thousands of responses, you know, some articles saying, yes, classical music is dead, it's, or it's, it's on its last legs and, you know, there must be significant change for classical music to, to keep going. And, and then there was response articles um, saying, oh no, classical music isn't dead, in fact, People, people have been saying for hundreds of years that classical music is dying and or is dead, and and here it is, still pushing on to another century, and you know, it's not that much different than it has been in the past, and you know, that's that's an art, an argument that you can go back and forth with, and and just talk yourself in circles, and I, I thought I would leave that specific argument to. <laughs> uh, Places like The New Yorker or <laughs> Slate.com or various uh, various outlets like that. I, I'm much more interested in talking to uh, musicians who are doing interesting things. And whether or not classical music is dying, one thing is definitely sure. And that is every year more and more musicians are, are coming out of music school and, and there are fewer jobs to accommodate them. And that, that's just the way it is. And... And as such, um, a lot of people are, are beginning to, or have been striking out on their own and, and creating incredible new projects, uh, very interesting approaches to old classical music and, and commissioning new composers and, and putting together things that maybe haven't been seen before. Um, and I, I wanted to talk to these people. I mean, I, I'm a freelancer here in New York and, and I meet these people on a daily basis who are who are putting together incredibly interesting things and and wonderful projects that that are getting noticed and and they're making their way they're they're making the living playing music and they're not doing it in a traditional sense uh, they're not playing in an orchestra full time they're not a member of an opera company they're not a full time member of a chamber group um, touring the country it's it's a very um, really a wonderful time we're living in because there's all of these opportunities and, and people are starting to take advantage of them. And, and it's just, there's so much new and interesting things coming every day. And, and I wanted to, to learn about it. And, and people that I talk to on a daily basis, they are coming out with their own thing. And, and you know, frequently... Unless they get a write up in the Times or or happen to have someone come by that that helps helps them out, you know, sometimes there's just not a whole lot of uh, there's not that many places for people to talk about who they are as a musician, why they chose to strike out in this way and and um, and create something new and uh, and something that hasn't been seen before, and I, I really wanted to find out about these musicians and find out why they do what they do, what they do, how they do what they do, how they're making it as a musician in in a difficult, uh, difficult world for, for people who, who, um, follow the art of music. And so I decided to just do it. Um, started lining up interviews, bought the equipment, and uh, and today I, I recorded my very first interview with with a wonderful trombonist uh, named David Whitwell. Um, me and David 
have known each other for a few years now. Um, we both studied with the same teacher for a while, uh, and we talk about that. And um, he's an interesting guy. He has a lot of very strong opinions about about the direction of classical music in the 21st century. And you know whether you agree with his opinions or not, he's going to do what he what he's going to do, and and he's doing it well, and he's he's being successful, and he's he's making it as a musician. I mean, there's no way around it. He's he's doing it, and um, so I sat down and talked with him about it for an hour and a half. Um, just a couple notes about the interview. It, it is August here in New York, um, so you'll hear you know some white noise from the air conditioner in the background. Otherwise, we would have been melting. Um, also, a couple of his cats come to say hi briefly throughout the interview. Um, uh, we had a great conversation. We had a good time. Um, and uh, we one, one note, um, we talk about an album that, uh, that he just put out with uh, David Taylor and Felix Del Tredici and the Low Brass Connection. Um, we speak at length about this about this recording, but we never really say what the name of the album is. Um, the name of the album is "The Sounds After the Oil War," and um, it will be available on iTunes uh, very soon in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, it's it's a really great. They do some really crazy stuff, and it's it's fascinating. Um, th- these guys are just great musicians. There's no way around it, um, and they're doing great stuff. So. Um, be on the lookout for that album. Um, if you want to uh, see more about David, uh, go to his website. It's davidwhitwelltrombone.com. Uh, he's also on Twitter at DW Trombone, uh, DW Caps, and then Trombone, all lowercase. Um, he's a cool guy, good friend of mine. Uh, so I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thanks. What's it called? Do we have a name yet? Yeah, I decided to go with uh, Divergent Paths, mm-hmm. which, I don't know, I thought about it for a while, and, uh, and I was like, well, you know, everyone kind of takes their own way. Yeah. Nowadays, at least. Everyone kind of was like, oh, well, what do I do? What do I do? There's not really a specific way anymore. No, yeah, yeah, there's no... There's no real way to... I mean, what, what's, what's the right way? What's the wrong way? I mean, yeah. if you're saying something important to an audience, mm-hmm. uh, then uh, hopefully they'll listen. Now that you've uh, had some time to settle in out here, how do you, how are you feeling about, how are you feeling about the, the, the place? I mean, you, you, <laughs> you settled in yet or what? Yeah, um, I'm, I need to buy a desk. Uh, for the for my studio in there, uh, which I, I've only been home for about ten days. We really actually lived in this apartment for about ten days, so I'm still setting up my studio. Um, really, really happy. It's it's a great little room. Mm. Very happy to have it. So, you've been uh, you've been practicing in here much? Any compl- yeah. complaints yet? No, um, I'm I'm really fortunate that I have a room that doesn't share walls with uh, with anything, and. Um, <laughs> It's in my lease that I'm a musician and I'm allowed to practice and they can't touch me. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I made it a thing because I just got done with a really bad legal battle at our last place that we were there for a very, very long time. And um, uh, a couple of night nurses moved in down the hall and it was a whole thing, but the the union gave me a lawyer right away, which was fantastic. Didn't know that was a thing they did. Yeah, if 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 you're in the union and you have a... Some sort of threat to your to your livelihood because you're a musician. The union will really step up to the plate for you. They're fantastic. Great. Local eight hundred two. All the way. <laughs> well, uh, you know, obviously they should be the ones sponsoring this. So. <laughs> they might send it out. You never know. Who yeah. knows? Well, I'm not not if I'm not a member, probably. <laughs> you should join the union. Man. It's fifty five dollars a quarter. Yeah, but it's they awesome. but they do make you pay it all up front. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, quarterly. I must have must have misread something. Yeah. Skip like like five drinks. You're there. <laughs> well, we'll see. I guess. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, you and I met various times over the past four or five years. However long. I don't, how long were you studying with Dave? 
Um, I was studying with him formally for two years, and um, and then we sort of moved into whatever phase we're in now. <laughs> Collaborator, is, mentor, yeah, yeah, whatever it is. So like we would we would run into each other before after lessons for whatever reason he always just like stuck the two of us right up against each other at you know wherever we were but uh so you know but we never actually ended up playing it together until last last year with the the trombone consort yeah i think was, when was that august was the, yeah august barge music yeah yeah the barge music here and now so yeah what when did you start the, the new york trombone consort uh like and why 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 that? You know, why, why did you, you know, it was you and Scott Sweeney, right? Right, yeah. So, um, New York Trombone Consort was started in uh, 2013. Um, and I had read about the Hutchins Consort, which is this really amazing string consort out on the West Coast, I believe. And uh, this amazing instrument builder decided to build, uh, I think there's eight instruments in that consort. He decided to build eight uh, stringed instruments that were all proportional to each other. So the, the the very smallest violin is like this sopranino violin. It's really quite small, and the biggest bass is is really like much quite larger than than a normal uh, double bass. And then there's a there's a few places in that consort where everything lines up, but the color that they can get is just absolutely unparalleled. And Scott and I were talking, and we said, well, wouldn't it be amazing? if we could get a group of all the trombones together and the kind of colors we can get out of that. And then not only can we show off the beautiful color that we can get from, from all five of these horns, but wouldn't it be amazing to start arranging crazy 20th and 21st century music and really pushing the envelope of new music with this really super antiquated setup? And, well, and of course, with trombone, you, you don't have to specially build anything. You already have. Five, exactly. to, five to six different kinds of trombone that are already built along the same lines, the same, you know, same structure, and you can just, <laughs> you're basically set up to go. A lot less work exactly. to, to set it up in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So, New York Trombone Consort. Yeah. One of those things, yeah. every, every time I talk to you, it's all pushing towards 20th, 21st century music, never really looking back towards you know, the, the more traditional repertoires, repertoire that trombonists are, I don't know, maybe forced, I don't know if I want to say forced to play, but in some cases, yeah, you're forced to learn your Mahler, you're forced to learn your Bruckner, and, uh, you know, I can't imagine the consort really latching on to a, a, a Jay Friedman arrangement of a, a Mahler or, or Bruckner, connect, excuse me, a, a chorale, uh, so why? why? Why push only in that direction? Right, uh, a few reasons. Um, so, for one, it, it's ground that's really been covered. Like you said, like all trombonists learn this stuff. We, we we play this stuff a lot. There's there's no there's no huge deficit of of trombonists playing sort of romantic music. It's it, it's very popular. So in in a way, and this is sort of a theme that I, I try to to follow in, in a lot of my career is I like to look for holes in the market. I like to look for places where I think something would fit really well or something that, that just doesn't exist quite yet. And I like to, to fill that gap with, with something that I, that I think is wonderful. So there's lots of trombonists playing this stuff. And I, I didn't feel it really necessary to rehash old territory because, frankly, it's been done. And I like to keep it fresh. No, I, I've spoken, I've brought up this point to various people before, you know, um, this specific point actually covering, as far as covering well-traveled ground, uh, I think the thing I was speaking of was Brahms in particular, mm -hmm. the four serious songs, which, you know, I do love Brahms songs, mm -hmm. They're, a lot of them are very beautiful, but of course the four serious songs are a standard of trombone repertoire, and I, I brought this up to, to Weston Sprott, and you know, I, I said something along the lines of, well, everyone plays this, why do I need to do it? And he's like, well, there's a reason everyone does it, it's, it's just good music. You know, so, what, you know, how do you think about it on that side? You know, you know I, I, don't, I don't know that you would say Brahms is necessarily <laughs> is bad music. No, yeah, I, uh, I, I have a, a, about a five-year project now of uh, recording the two 
cello sonatas from E minor and F major cello sonatas. E minor's sonata. a great one. The, it's a super, super big challenge, and, and it's, it is really good music. Um, but if we expect our instrument and our craft and really the whole field of art music to move forward, there is no space for people to be spinning their wheels. And I understand playing repertoire in an academic context, and, but I, I also have issues with making everybody go over the same ground, because if you tell everybody the same thing in school, they're probably going to come up with the, the similar ideas when they get out of school. So if you start educating people differently, maybe their the substance of what they're doing changes, and maybe eventually the field changes, and maybe eventually art music's place in the society of America, or our, our cultural fabric, could, could change. Yeah. No, that's fair. So let's, let's like, shift back to more, uh, like, a, a more personal kind of portrait of, mm -hmm. of David Whitwell. Portrait. Uh, <laughs> so, pretty basic, where are you from, you know? The rundown, yeah. Yeah, just, you know, the rundown, just kind of a, you know, where are you from, what, what, uh, what was that like? I mean. Great, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure, sure. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Um, I grew up uh, in a town called Vanita Park, which is um, right next. It's in the same county as uh, as Ferguson. If you uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of the things that have gone on in Ferguson recently, of course. Um, so uh, we 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 didn't have very much growing up. My father was a preacher. My mother was a computer technician. Um, That's an interesting. It's it's interesting a strange combo. Match. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So my mother was the main breadwinner in the house. Um, and my brother and I were homeschooled. So um, my, my brother and I were homeschooled until I was about 14. He's two years older than I. And uh, then we went to a parochial prep school. So when, when in there did you start with the tromboning? You know, why, why did you start? Like, why, <laughs> why pick trombone? Why, why move forward with something like that? It's a kind of a strange thing to start out with. Yeah, yeah um, it, it was happenstance, really. Um, we had a little church orchestra. It was just, you know, some odd strings and winds and brass that got together and they accompanied the hymns and the choir in church. And uh, the guy that sort of ran everything came by uh, Sunday school one day and he said, hey, I need somebody to learn the trombone and we need one more trombone in the little church band. So, you know, work, work on it for, you know, five, six months and, you know, we'll we'll have you come and join the church band. And I thought that that was just a really fun idea. So I gave it a try. And uh, I guess along, uh, I guess when I was about 13, I, I decided that, that this was a route I wanted to go professionally. I was really enjoying it. So I started uh, improv lessons first. Improv um, lessons, like what, how old were you? <laughs> I was, uh, I guess I was about 14 when I started uh, like just, legit jazz lessons um that's uh okay i mean when you put it in a jazz context i guess it makes more sense but yeah how long how long did you play with the church orchestra i mean did, did you did you love it did you you know start out loving it and end up just hating it or um i mean i, I didn't i didn't know anything else I, I thought it was really fun to to play with other people and I, I thought that was a lot of fun and you know i, I didn't really know anything but hymns and you know romantic period music and back that's all we had in the house was you know, like pretty much goodness we didn't even really have copeland in the house it was pre pre 20th century everything in the house um you just uh uh just stop on one thing there mm -hmm. i mean you said that you started or you kind of decided when you were like 13 that you wanted to that trombone is kind of a thing you wanted to do mm -hmm. i think you know it's interesting you know, most, a lot of professions, you don't, you don't really figure out what it is you're going to do until much later, comparatively. I mean, you figure right. out when you're young. Some people don't figure out until, you know, their late 20s. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, music, it's, it's kind of something you have to decide on early, as opposed to, you know, For if sure. someone wants to be, decides they want to be an investment banker, you know, it's, it's kind of something that they figure out later, and then they, they, they adjust their schooling. But, but in in your case, you're like you're 13. Hey, I want to. <laughs> I want to just keep going with this whole trombone thing. See how far that takes me, and then and then you started lessons, or had you had lessons previous to that? Um, I mean, somebody at the church showed me 
where the positions were and <laughs> what overtones are and, and things like that. But um, that, that's more or less where that stopped and I was on my own from, I, I guess, you know, about age 7 to about age 13. And I, I noodled around at home and I had, you know, a couple little solo books that I really enjoyed trying to play through. And, and uh, yeah, it, I got really serious about it and then I was, uh, I was fortunate that there was a good band program at uh, the prep school where, where my brother and I were sent. And it just sort of kept going from there. And I, I started, I got really, really into jazz. And so I decided that my first formal lessons would be in jazz. And I studied really, really hard all throughout high school. Um, uh, I, was, <laughs> I was in a really serious ska band, which was a really great time. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. of course, it's the early 2000s. Obviously. What else are you yeah. going to do? <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were called the Monscosities. Of course. Because all good ska bands have to have the word ska in their name, of course. Um, <laughs> and uh, I had a little, uh, a little trio, sometimes quartet uh, thing that we would play standards. So we played at like Borders Bookstore. Oh. And uh, that's we, that's a very uh, old statement, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to Blockbuster after you finished playing at Borders? Oh, <laughs> you know, I, probably, probably. Oh yeah, let's go rent Ghostbusters, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm curious because I mean we've you and I have spoken about our you know it's very it's interesting because of our similar shared backgrounds, very mm -hmm. conservative Christian homes. Mm -hmm. um, just curious because at least with my with my family being very very conservative you know the same kind of thing you have your your christian music your hymns and your romantic classics your tchaikovsky your bach your mozart and that's what we listen to at home but i don't know i wasn't allowed to listen to jazz um, Ditto. Ditto. In, the, in the house so I'm, I'm curious as like what you know did they just let you start playing jazz even though you weren't allowed to listen to it in the house or yeah, there's actually quite a bit of conflict uh, between my father and I at that point in my life. Um, uh, I remember I, I very uh, covertly bought a copy of Kind of Blue, of course. and uh, and I would listen to it on my headphones in my room, and that was that was my there was def definitely a, a forbidden fruit kind of feeling to, <laughs> to me playing jazz and studying jazz, and uh, at, at one point. Uh, my father told me that if I didn't stop playing that devil jazz, he was going to wrap my trombone around a tree. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, how, how about that? He didn't, really, fortunately for me. <laughs> did, did you respond by playing Old Devil Moon? Or something? No, no, I, I was not nearly that clever. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. I mean, for me, for me it was uh, taking my radio and listening after, after I think, Around eight or nine o'clock every night, NPR would play would have jazz programming for an hour. Mm, Mary uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when Wednesday night would be uh, jazz profiles. Mm -hmm. So I was you know learning about Artie Shaw and and JJ Johnson and, and yeah. you know by night huddled around my my little five dollar radio oh, yeah. that I would get the NPR station on, which was uh, which was good times. Learned a lot about learned a lot about music from those from those night. You know, getting oh, the, yeah. the Lincoln Center Orchestra coming in, which you know you can say whatever you want, but at the time you know about them. But you can at the time it was it was really out there for me personally. Yeah, I mean they're probably the best door into jazz for the uninitiated. Or may do so many great yeah. things for educational, you know, education in the community and stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, well, so you you know you keep doing this jazz thing. Right. Um, yeah. So I um. I, I got a, a big scholarship to go to Webster University in, uh, in St. Louis, and I did uh, about two years of a jazz degree there. Um, I, uh, when I auditioned, I actually I auditioned and I got into the classical program and I got into the jazz program as well. And, I, it would, and so I, I started in sort of both of those programs simultaneously. I was in the orchestra and I was in the big band I was in the, there was also like an experimental big band that, 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 that sort of introduced me to a lot of um, new improvisatory techniques and, and new things. And I was also in um, the, the, the brass chamber music program. So, so were you the only person there doing all of it? Or were there, was everyone kind of in everything or? Um, it, it was a pretty small program, so there was a lot of crossover. Um, but nobody comes to mind that 
that, that sort of did everything with me all at the same time. But, um, but that's not to say that there wasn't someone. I, I, there probably was. But. So where did the whole idea of like really striking out on your own to kind of create, create your own path, like, uh, you know, create your own path as far as your playing, as far as your soloing, as far as like creative projects that you're putting together yourself, where did that kind of, where did that germ start? Yeah, um, so I was, uh, I, my, my then girlfriend, now wife and I moved from St. Louis to New York City. Uh, and I took a year off in that time to practice and to move and it was probably the best decision I've ever made. It was just fantastic. I, I took piano lessons at Brooklyn Conservatory, or sorry, Brooklyn School of Music, it was then, um, and that allowed me uh, practice space during the daytime. So I took piano lessons but I practiced trombone in their studios pretty much all day every day. and. Uh, really didn't have a whole lot of direction at that point, but I, I started playing in a few of the ensembles at Brooklyn College in anticipation of enrolling there, um, I guess the, the, the following fall. So I, I moved in, in fall and started practicing every day at this place, and then sort of hooked up with the, everything happening at Brooklyn College, and then started, started there. So uh, before that, I had been introduced to Ingolf Dahl, uh, not the person, just the music, um, uh, when I was still living in St. Louis. And the, the idea of, of brass chamber music really just, I was really, really taken with it. My teacher at the time was Jim Martin, mm -hmm. uh, fantastic bass trombonist, uh, used to be in the Buddy Rich Band, um, played in Chicago Symphony, St. Louis, Minneapolis, uh, all over the place. Really a truly consummate musician, really, really brilliant individual. And so he, he sort of kept feeding me things to listen to and and I, I really had the the idea even before I moved to New York that that I wanted to to really communicate in small scale settings I wasn't really satisfied to be playing chord tones in the back of the orchestra um, I just I, I just felt like it was a it was a waste of my time to to do that but then again that I, I've never really enjoyed team sports that much <laughs> well, yeah. yeah I mean it's I mean, what you in high school you wrestled, right? Yeah, yeah. I started and that's, wrestling. That's when a I was very, five. it's a very individual sport. Right. Um, right it's yeah. just you know you versus one guy. Yeah. Um, you know you're part of a team, but <laughs> individual mat. You know you're not going to have a team beating up on one <laughs> on another team. It's not, yeah, yeah. That's not, a not, so a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not so much a wrestling. Not so much the pitched battle between two sides. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, did, does that you know? Does that we've we've talked about being a loner before, like in, in what you do, uh, you know, is that completely separate? Do you think you know? Do you think that has anything to do with why you you picture yourself as like kind of one man striking out in a way, you know, sure. at least to com create his own thing, not necessarily oh I can do this without anyone else, but sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it would be it would be ludicrous to say that there's no connection between me being homeschooled and playing individual sports my entire life, and uh, I, I mean, e even when I started to go to non-home school, to, to, you know, school with other children, um, <laughs> I, I was always kind of a contrarian, uh, I always kind of wanted to, wanted to do my own thing, so it, yeah, th there's definitely a connection with, with being, with, with that outsider feeling, and, and what I'm doing now, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can remember even in high school, I really wanted to, to play some brass quartets. So I went to the sheet music store and I brought some brass quartets. And I was in the ninth grade and, uh, and I, I tried, to, tried to get some other people to play brass quartets with me. But I was, you know, I was in the ninth grade, I was just a terrible reader. <laughs> and it, it fell apart in, you know, a matter of minutes. But uh, it's, it's, I, I've always wanted to, I, I've always wanted to be able to present something to, to an audience, yeah. And that's kind of translated to now when you're, yeah. you're it seems like you're constantly doing, <laughs> putting together projects that no one else is, no one else is really trying to do or, or yeah. has even conceived of or, you know, what, when did you, 
So what what year was it that you moved to New York and took that year? Um, that must have been two thousand and seven, I think. Two thousand seven. So yeah. when did you know were you were you being you said you were studying were you studying with Jim Martin here? Was it was it here you were studying with him or was that previously? He's in St. Louis. He's in St. Louis. So yeah. what yeah. your your year off here were you being kind of artistically guided by anyone or were you just kind of just hitting the hitting you know hitting the books and like just practicing your butt off? Yeah, I, I took a few stray lessons. Um, I took a lesson with Per Brevig. I took a lesson with Michael Powell. Um, I took one or two with Bruce Bombasudo, who I wound up studying for a few years with at Brooklyn College. Um, and I, I uh, they, they, they gave me some great guidance. Um, and I, I don't really operate too well on the, the week by week guidance kind of thing. I like more big trajectory changes, and, and I like a lot of autonomy in that. I remember speaking with uh, a guy I used to study with, uh, Jim Kraft, who was he was in the National Symphony for thirty years, and. And I was studying with him in Indiana, and uh, we were talking about the same thing, this concept of, of week-to-week lessons, because no matter, if you're, in, if you're enrolled at a college, you sign up for weekly lessons, like 14 lessons in a semester, 14 or 15. So mm-hmm. you're, you're in there every week, you know, unless you arrange it to be, you know, do two-hour lessons every other week. And he, he even said to me, he was just like, you know, one, le- one lesson a week is just too much. Once you hit a certain point, like... You're just kind of, you go in there for a lesson, you're just kind of sitting there looking at each other like, well, I mean, how much can you really have accomplished artistically in seven days? Sure. I mean, when you're, when you're just trying to figure out who you are as a musician. Yeah, it's ludicrous. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of a strange, strange thing to expect of, of a 19-year-old musician to, you know, initially maybe you want that week to week when you're still building, sure. building that, that base of, of technical excellence but after when you're getting into the musical ideas it takes longer to to figure things out i would you know mm-hmm. i would think you know sometimes i still I go, I go in and i talk to dave after seeing him a week dave taylor after seeing him a week earlier and yeah sure i mean i can play the same thing for you but you know and i figured some things out but not enough to really necessarily fill 60 to 70 minutes of of yep. so you just end up kind of talking or yep. bullshitting mm-hmm. for for an hour um, so when, what, when did you like, what was the first like real project where you felt like you were striking out and doing something unusual once you got to, once you got to New York? Um, I guess in my first year at Brooklyn College, um, I wanted to do an all Hindemith concert. So, um, I got some, some like Hindemith wind quintets together, um, and I had a quartet and we played, uh, Morgan music, um, and we, we had a really great time. And uh, I played uh, the trombone sonata. I think the like somebody played the oboe sonata. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just an afternoon concert. I just wanted to have a lot of hand with pieces on the same program. And it, it was really satisfying, and it worked really, really well. And we had a decent turnout. And I began to think, oh, you know, maybe, you know, having an idea and making it happen is fun. And this was at Brooklyn College. Yeah, yeah. You did this. Mm-hmm. And- so, what was the response to that? I mean, you, you said you had a decent turnout. Did you, you know, did you get kind of any kind of feedback from the from the crowd that came out? Or yeah, I mean, pe- people enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, normal concert feedback, but it, it was it was. I mean, a Hindemith good... isn't something that's necessarily super out there. That's a pretty you exactly. Know, but it, you know, Hindemith did some great. You know, he wrote great stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His yeah. music is, is incredible and, and very interesting. You know backstory and, and how how he came to to do what he did mm-hmm. but sorry yes continue <laughs> yeah i mean it, uh, the I, I didn't get you know nothing revolutionary happened with, with that with that little project but it was one of the first times uh where i was able to put together uh, a presentation of art music and it went really well and and people really enjoyed it i mean i i put together you know lots of jazz projects and booked lots of jazz gigs before that and and the same with the, the ska band, you know, we, we booked, we played, God, you know, probably a hundred shows when I was in high school. But, you know, this was the first time when I was doing art music uh, that wasn't improvised. And, and even when I was playing jazz mostly, uh, we, we, we just played standards, you know, we weren't really striking out into anywhere interesting. Um, not that the standards aren't interesting, but standards aren't interesting. So... <laughs> <laughs> so 
then, you know, how did you transition from putting on these concerts of art, art music within an academic setting to, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, it can be difficult to book concerts of strange things outside of an academic setting because with, with, when you're in the confines of a college, you know, you're kind of set up where you can, you can pretty much put on any concert you want. Right, and, yeah, and, yeah. and they'll and they'll give you a space. They'll record it. Yeah. You know, people might not come, but people could come if you if you like really hit the bricks and and and, and publicize about it. But once you get outside of that, you know, you're 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 struck. You're up against the idea of you know having to book a space and having to book sound you know sound engineers and mm -hmm. trying to get more than four people to come. Right, 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 right. So where you know how did you how did you move from that academic setting into I don't. I don't want to say a real world setting, but you know, out. Oh yeah. Real I mean, I guess setting. yeah. You yeah. could say a real world set, real world non academia based setting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't get more real than trying to play weird stuff in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess uh, two projects were going on, uh, kind of at the same time. Um, uh, I had a, a group called um, it, back then. It was called Let's Eat (parentheses Children). Um, it was uh, me and a tuba and a drummer, uh, a great friend of mine named Chad Walther, who's a fantastic tubist, and a great drummer named Pat O'Reilly. Um, we were all studying a lot of like 20th century masterworks for our instruments, um, and we all decided that we wanted to get together and we wanted to blend uh, a lot of just really hard-nosed improvisation with um, a lot of this this. 20th and 21st century stuff we were playing. We thought it would be a really fun thing to do. So we, we started um, improvising with tone row matrices, uh, which was really, really fun. We would all <laughs> have the matrix, and sometimes even the percussionist would have the matrix in front of him. He would play marimba or some vibes or something. And uh, that's, would, not a, that's not a statement you hear very often is, you know, we were dealing with 12, you know, tone row matri matrices, and it was really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it was just something that we, I mean, I'm sure somebody's done it somewhere, um, but we, so we would have these, like, lead sheets where instead of having chords on the lead sheet, we would have um, iterations of the row, so it would say, you know, RI3, and, you know, whoever was playing the bass at that point would, would walk a bass line with that with, with the, that, you know, the retro, row, yeah. retrograde inversion. Yeah, exactly, Whee! yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So that, that was really fun, and we, we, we messed around with that quite a bit. Um, sort of at the same time that that was happening, um, I had just finished premiering a new piece by a great friend of mine named Amir Spielmann, mm -hmm. um, a fantastic Israeli composer. Yeah. Um, it's sort of, he's got a crazy route that he's taken, but now he's a super successful composer. Yeah, Europe. right. <laughs> he's been commissioned by Ensemble Intercontemporain. Mm -hmm. um, he, and this year he's been commissioned to write a truly gargantuan piece for the European Capital of Culture in, this year it's in Wroclaw, Poland. Uh, he's doing a piece for, I think it's like 200 something person orchestra and 400 person choir and like they're dropping shit from the sky, <laughs> like literally dropping stuff from the sky. So he's gone on to do really incredible things. Were, so you, guys, were you guys in school together? Or? We were in school together, yeah, yeah. So what year, um, what year about is, are we talking that you're doing these two ensembles? So this must have been between, um, somewhere between 2008 and 2012, something like that. <laughs> okay, yeah. so I mean it was a while you were, you were working with these guys. Right, yeah, so uh, Amir wrote me a piece um, called Abashment for solo trombone and string quartet, and he happened to be really tight with the Mivos string quartet. Mm -hmm. um, who were not nearly as big as they are now, but now they're one of the most sought after string quartets in all of new music <laughs> Um And so I, I was able to premiere this really incredible piece with these like really musicians that were just on a totally different plane of existence than I was. And at the same time, we, uh, we were close with uh, the guy that ran the computer music lab mm -hmm. at Brooklyn College named Nick Nelson. And all three of us decided that we needed a symphonietta. Of course. And we, well, obviously, we, in a symphonietta. I mean. Obviously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had all these big dreams and all these things that we wanted to play. Um, and so we, over the course of a few years, we, we got some funding together. 
Uh, we got a lot of amazing players together, and we had a debut concert. Um, it was called, and we, we called it Ensemble Moto Perpetuo, um, and it uh, continues to this day. We yeah, I remember, a lot of, yeah, I remember, was it, what year was this? Um, our first concert with EMP was, uh, I think, 2010. Yeah, I remember popping up and someone, you know, someone saying, saying something about it, and then, I mean, because this was before we met, but, you know, mm -hmm. that was, it was some, one of those things where I heard her rumblings about it, but didn't know enough about it to be like, oh, I should go to, <laughs> I yeah. should go to that. It's, you know, it's hard to keep track of everything when there's so much happening, but. Yeah, it's hard to go to shows. So yeah. what was, what, what kind of response did you get to those, you know, to these, these Moto Perpetuo concerts? So uh, our first show was um, just, just a really unexpected su success. We, uh, we played Jason Eckhart's piano concerto called Trespass. Mm -hmm. Um, which if you haven't heard Jason Eckhart's music, look him up. It'll, it, it's the most enthralling, captivating stuff you'll ever hear. Um, we played um, a piece by an Icelandic composer that we were working with named Anna Torvald's daughter. Mm -hmm. who, she's also gone on to do really amazing things. And we played um, a great piece by Philippe Manoury called Instant Pluriel, uh, or Instantly Plural. Uh, it was for two chamber ensembles back to back with two different conductors. Had a lot of crossfading of pitch and tempi, you know, mm -hmm. just just a real blast. Um, so we were really fortunate. We got a really awesome review in the Times of that show. And this is the very and, first concert. Yeah, our, our debut concert. We got a really awesome review in the New York Times. <laughs> um, somebody was sending press releases to the right people. Yeah. So we we were really fortunate. And well, I mean, it seems like the Times does a pretty good job of keeping their ear to the ground for interesting projects coming out. But at the same time. You know, you have to have someone that's that's really, you know, sending out blasts very consistently. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Having somebody that with a really excellent press contact list is totally invaluable. <laughs> Gotta have it. Yeah. So, um, so so booking booking sort of like jazz shows and uh, chamber music shows with um, Let's See Children, which we eventually changed the name to Trio TBD. <laughs> or to a bass, or, or, or trombone, uh, what, what did we call it? It was tuba bone drums, right, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And then we, we've sort of used that name for uh, different instrumentations, and a couple of buddies of mine now, we do trombone, bass, and drums. Yeah. Uh, not to be confused with um, a really great group called Bass Drumbone, um, <laughs> which uh, I can't remember the name of the trombonist in that group, uh, but he's fantastic. Um, yeah. You probably probably have an easier time pulling pulling people in with a name like TBD as opposed to Let's Eat Children. Right. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, it, just just con you know possibly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we we thought we were being very cute, but uh, you know. <laughs> apparently some people didn't think so. Yeah. No, not, <laughs> not so much. Not so much. Yeah. So um, those two experiences and working with those two groups, and I was still sort of in the shelter of uh, an undergraduate program really showed me that hey you know you can have ideas and if you if you ask the right people mm -hmm. and if you ask in the right way and if you ask persistently enough you can get funding and you can get other people on board with your projects and you can get other people excited about your projects and you can even get people in the door and to, to give you 10 bucks to, to hear yeah. what you're doing and uh, everything sort of is has, has blossomed from there. So I, I, after that, I went and did my master's at Manhattan School of Music, um, and I developed a great relationship with Dave, and uh, I sort of have a, a giant stack of projects that I work on now. So, I mean, it, the, here's the the thing, though. You I mean you can you can publicize it well, you can get the funding, you can get the people in the door, but once all of that happens, you have to present a a product that people mm -hmm. want to he want to hear again, mm -hmm. you know, or want to talk about, um, you know, you have to be able to speak to people with your music, you know, in a way that maybe they haven't heard before, mm -hmm. or just, you know, at the pinnacle of something that they have heard before. I mean, if they've heard it before, you want to present it in a way that they can be like, I don't care if I've heard this before, I'm down, you know, so, so like what... How do you approach? How do you approach that? Like, I mean, how do you make sure that your what you're saying is something that they want to hear, or you just or do you just trial and error it? 
Um, <laughs> for, for a long time, I kind of trialed and errored it, but um, I, I came to the conclusion uh, a long while ago that standing on a stage and playing, and even playing good music really, really well is just not enough in 2015. Um, sometimes it could be, and in Europe, it is good enough because there's, there's a, a cultural fabric that appreciates art music without frills, without interdisciplinary interactions, without you know, thematic or programmatic associations. They, the audiences over there are ready for it and they're happy about it. Over here, it's a different scene. We have a different culture, we have different audiences. So what I like to do is I like to find extra musical processes and phenomena and I like to point programs at those things. So um, a good example of this is um, a group that the Underground Brass is doing uh, this coming season is all about the process of civil unrest. Mm -hmm. And so we, we did a lot of reading about what happens during revolutions and uprisings because I, I was really you know, deeply affected by everything that was happening in Ferguson, because that's where I grew up. Um, so we decided that we're going to take the, the, the sort of the template of a revolution or a civil unrest or an uprising or, or something, and we're going to program to that. So we're, we're doing uh, three big sections. We're going to do, you know, rising conflict and then conflict and then a return to status quo, because really in in the u.s what's going to happen is we're going to return to the status quo and it, it, nothing nothing is really going to change and it, it's it's a very pessimistic view to take on things but if you notice this entire time i haven't mentioned a single composer i haven't mentioned an instrumentation i haven't mentioned um you know the lengths of pieces or anything about that we're talking about civil unrest and i think that's what's really really important uh, and that's what's going to save art music, is making ourselves relevant and inserting art music into the middle of the discussion about much, much, much larger topics. Because when you think about it, art is a, a mirror that you can hold up to society, and society can look at itself and say, this is good or this is not good. And there's a lot of dissenting opinions on this, and a lot of people think that uh, programmatic music, or, or rather, um, Meredith Monk described it as uh, pointy music, music that points <laughs> right. at, at other things. Um, a lot of people think that it's really important to present something extremely abstract and extremely blank and let the audience form their own associations. And that's just one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be a little more blunt about things. I like to, to, to push what I do uh, towards a conversation that I'm not control. I, I don't want to control the conversation, but I want to show people what's happening. Right. Um, it's it's almost like a journalistic programming or <laughs> something like this. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's there is a you know a pretty decent tradition of this happening throughout in the classical music world throughout throughout the centuries. Um, sure. Not although it seems like it's not as the it's not as vibrant as it possibly once was. I mean, it's it's hard to say if you're not there what's what's vibrant, what's not. Um, I mean, I think one example that I can think of is, of course, um, in a traditional setting, is more more traditional setting would be Shostakovich's the symphony. Sure. You know, sure. or or you know, even a lot of his work in, in general being mm -hmm. being directed pointy, if you will. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. in in relation to his government, and it, it's hard to. F you know, figure out how to do that in a way that is both offensive in a good way, like mm -hmm. offensive in, yeah. in pushing people towards action, or at least... It incites. Yeah, it, it, it incites, you know, to at least, at the very least, make people question what they their preconceived notions about how our society functions. Right, right. I think a lot of the reason of, of why the field of art music looks the way it does today is we, we've had this, this big pressure of, of dwindling audiences, dwindling interest, and the biggest thing that humans do when they're threatened is we retreat to something that feels secure. And music being such an esoteric and subjective field, we try to latch on to anything in our field that feels objective, 
that feels stable in in this storm of you know lack of finances and you know our our you know our audience base just dying off every year. <laughs> so I mean, what what is objective in art music? I mean, we we have the historical aspect of art music. So you've seen this rise in. Uh, period performance groups and, and uh, you know uh, period instruments of course. and uh, there was just a, a wonderful article that I read um, I, I wholeheartedly disagree <laughs> with what they're doing but it was really interesting to read about there's a pianist that uh, has read uh, piano technique treatises from from you know several hundred years ago and has adopted those playing techniques it, it mentioned like keeping your elbows into your side and and, and they've used computers to try and map what these different techniques do to the actual instrument. She, of course, she's playing like a, like a period pianoforte. And, and I just couldn't help but think, like, you're, you're using a computer to try to be more antiquated. <laughs> and, uh, th I mean, th this, this speaks to sort of a lot of things in the entire field of musicology, which I also have some problems with. But it, we, we, we've retreated into objectivity. And it even, it, it, it has trickled all the way into the popular way that people play the trombone. I mean, the, the most objective thing you can do when you sit down and read a piece of music is to play exactly what's on the page and nothing more and nothing less. And you get sort of this, this vapid, vacuous, like hollow husk of what was music, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very strongly of the opinion that that music is a shell that must be filled by a person, and then that person can come out and dance around and do something beautiful for the audience. But just presenting the shell on a stage is, yeah, is not okay. It's interesting. I mean, even the most you, you're talking about retreating into this this objective. Um, comfort zone musically, and it's it's interesting to go back and look at the pieces that they're retreating to, and mm -hmm. and many times that these these very pieces that they're retreating to as being safe in the time that they were being originally performed, in the manner that they're trying to recreate these pieces were pushing pushing the envelope. They were all crazy when they were premiered. Right. So yeah. so you know you think of you think of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Of course, that's a that's a devastating piece yeah. and it was railed against when it premiered that and must have been bonkers to hear the premiere of, of course piece. and and oh. you know and he obviously he killed himself a week later etc cetera, etc cetera. you know that's pretty you know everyone knows this but now we go back to it and and you play it again and and it becomes instead of being that that ball that fireball that it was at its premiere presumably that inspired so much anger and hate against against it that mm -hmm. you know that Tchaikovsky killed himself and it and it's just you know yes it's beautiful yes it's devastating but there, there, it's sometimes in a lot of cases with certain conductors it, it feels like it's missing something even though each note is might be perfect and each dynamic might be followed to the absolute T and 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 you the the crash of the strings as you move into the fourth movement is, is it's there and it's you know it's it swells and it dies away as like just exactly like it's supposed to but at the same time you're you know it's not being filled with that that craziness that it would have been filled with at its premiere and I'm not saying that you you can't go back to that and do that do you know you can't it's not it's not that you can't go back and redo things like that but you have to approach it in a way it, it seems to me that you'd have to approach it in a way to you know, push it as opposed to just recreating or at least or approximating fire you know or right. or or danger you know in a way right and when and when a, a group approaches uh, a piece and strives to play it as it was played when it was first premiered you know however many hundreds of years ago they're missing a really re they're missing half of the room that was there They've got the musicians and they've got the instruments and they've got all sorts of ideas and guesses about how all of this must have been played, but they're completely ignoring the other half of the room, which was the audience. And the audience had all these preconceptions and all of these familiarities that audiences today probably don't have. 
And th there's a reason why the clothes that are made every year don't look the same every year. I mean, when, when Christian Dior sort of premiered his, his, his new, you know, chic little black dress, which was just a big, beautiful A-line dress at the time, which <laughs> wasn't little at all. When he did that, it was the most chic and amazing thing ever. And sure, there's a timelessness to it that's, that's really wonderful. Just like there's there's a timelessness to, to Bach or Beethoven or Brahms or, or something, but when you go to Fashion Week at Bryant Park, they're not marching the exact same dresses down the runway. They're not trying to figure out the exact same materials that they they used to make the original dress. They're not going and getting the same sewing machines that Christian Dior had in Paris. <laughs> To sew the dresses, and, and, and that's exactly what the I mean. That's precisely that's, that's what That's exactly doing. what. Yeah. That's exactly what you know. Twenty first century orchestras seem to be doing. Um, you know, and there's probably there's hundreds of people who probably just throw a fit over over someone saying that. But I don't I don't think you can really argue the fact that that's that's kind of how you how they approach it. Yeah. You know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> I'll say it. I mean, there's a reason that the serpent stopped being played in Berlioz. Yeah, I mean the serpent. I, I think the serpent's an interesting instrument to play, and and it'd be it's you know be cool to write new music for it. Sure, yeah. you know, and it's it's an interesting thing to hear, and it's yeah. an interesting curiosity to perform Berlioz yeah. with it. But it's you know why why pull yourself back into that into that situation when we right. we 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 already did it. We did it two hundred years ago. You know, we can move on. <laughs> right. It, it's you're you're exactly right. There's, there's so much that we need to be pushing for. There's so much important things happening today. And the sooner we realize that the pursuit of creating art is entirely different from the pursuit of historically preserving old music. These are two entirely separate jobs with entirely separate ideas behind them mm -hmm. and it's it's ludicrous to think that that we can that we can do both jobs but for some reason our, our labels are all crossed and we're the only field in the art world that has their labels all mixed up and that has their priorities all mixed up I mean look at look at the visual art world I mean there's there's you know several fantastic museums that are all dedicated to preserving art that has come before but there are hundreds of galleries in New York City that are dedicated to pushing brand new artists out there. Every week, you know. There's, there's Every a, week. There's a new, there's a, something new coming out, something new, something interesting, and it's being written about. You know, it's not like it's being ignored either. I mean, people are, are noticing, people are writing right. about it, people, you know, and, and maybe the artists aren't necessarily making their living off of it, but they're, they're putting it out there. Right, right, yeah, and, and it, it just like the fashion world. I mean, you you know, Jean Paul Gaultier can send some like insane studded jacket with like a <laughs> nine foot high collar down the runway, and you know that's not going to make it into the stores. Like people aren't going to run out and buy that, but elements of that are eventually going to filter into the way yeah. we dress every day. So like Beethoven. Is that they're like the they're like the fruit of the loom underwear. They're like yeah, like we're they're there. We've all heard it. We're all still wearing it on our bodies, and but we're not really thinking about it every day. Yeah, it's something that's important and it keeps us from chafing. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's no reason that we need to have gigantic presentations of tidy here. Fruit of, yeah. <laughs> fruit of right. the underwear. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, moving on from that, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I feel like we've covered that probably more than enough. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, so what are, you, what are you working on right now? I mean, you just got back from, you know, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but, yeah. um, you know, you just got back from a second, a third, uh, fourth, fourth tour of Europe? Third, third trip to Europe. Third trip to Europe, yeah, yeah, and yeah. You, you do this. You do this mostly in the summer. Yeah, June um, and July every year. Um, I have uh, a bunch of projects that that sort of recur every year, um, and I I go over and I travel around and I play with different people. 
So the, the projects that I have over there, um, I used to be in the, the Britain Peers Contemporary Ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, they, they paid for flights and, and things like that. It's connected to the Aldborough Festival. It's in the east of England. Um, some really, really wonderful new music, and we play some Elliot Carter and some Bruno Moderna, and um, really, really great uh, staples of the 20th century. And then we had a whole like corral of composers, mostly British composers that we would work with. Mm -hmm. um, I have a percussion and trombone duo that's based uh, simultaneously here in New York and also in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, we put out an album pretty recently um, and we were working on a tour for this coming summer. Um, I have a couple of projects in Germany. Um, one of them is uh, called the Xenophobia, there's a Xenophobia Quartet and a Xenophobia Septet um, where we play free jazz that's directed um, in opposition to the Pegida movement, which is uh, this uh, quasi anti Nazi ultra right, w or sorry, um, anti um, Islamic, anti. Um, uh, it, they're anti a lot of stuff. <laughs> Pe Pegida is a really big can of worms, but it's the, the extreme far right in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's uh, often associated with the neo Nazi party. Um, and there's some wonderful. Uh, jazz musicians that I work with on that. Um, uh, also, I, I, I do some solo recitals in, in Germany. Um, uh, I do a bunch of solo recitals in Italy, um, and I have some wonderful composers and organizations down there that I produce shows with and work on. Um, so, how long did it? Yeah. I mean, you've been. This is you said this is your third, then your third summer doing trips over there. I mean, how how long did it take you to build these relationships to kind of kind of put this, you know, and now it seems like you have you know, all these different things, you know, in different different countries, like you yeah. have these relationships, you have these organizations that you work with, I mean, how kind of how long yeah. did it take you to build those relationships? Um, I guess a, a lot of these came from um, a call for scores that I did a really long time ago, um, and I had uh, some new pieces for trombone and organ written, uh, and that's sort of like what started some relationships in Italy. Um, and just through various people, I I, I, I I like to to figure out what people are into, and if I'm if I'm into you know any aspect of that, I like to really take that and, and organize as much as we can and mm -hmm. push as much as we can. Um, yeah, great. So um, yeah. so I mean that that all went great, and you had how how were the how were the crowds over there this summer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're good. I mean, it, it's all about, you know, what kind of publicity you have, mm -hmm. um, you know, who you're working for, where you're working, what you're playing. Um, so, you know, can, you, know you, <laughs> you, you play a free jazz show in Berlin, like, you know, you can imagine how many people show up to that. <laughs> um, you know, you play you play Puccini in Italy, you can imagine how many people show up to yeah, that. Yeah, you'll get a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, things are pretty... No massive surprises, um, right? But yeah. you're you're satisfied with the work you do? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm pretty pretty happy with, with what's happening, and next year is going to be even better. Um, everything things build yeah. year to year. You know. Um, so you you recently put together an album featuring and including. Our wonderful mentor, David Taylor. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. When uh, when did you finish that up? It was pretty recently, right? Yeah. So we um, we recorded that last year in the Netherlands mm -hmm. with an amazing group over there called the Low Brass Connection. Right. Yes. Um, and it's a, it's a show that that I came up with and I, I wrote the program for. It uh, it's uh, a picture of the American emotional response to the Iraq War. Uh, via the five stages of grief, mm -hmm. it's the Kudo Ross model. Of course, um, obviously. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like most people aren't familiar with the yeah. actual name of the, the model. You know. Yeah, I had to but look it up. Used, it was, but yeah, used, used to the the steps, but not necessarily the. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Kubler Ross was the one that that wrote it uh, in a book called On Death and Dying. Oh, it sounds like chipper. A, very chipper. Nice, yeah. nice summer beach read. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, it's okay. So you put yeah, this so we, um, yeah, we we recorded all the ensemble uh, parts in the Netherlands. Then we came back to New York and recorded and all the solo parts, uh, which included a really big uh, concerto that Dave wrote for himself. Um, Is that the uh, the Iron Man? 
No, this is uh, it's called Too Sweet. Um, oh, the, the of course, Too Sweet. T O O S U I T E. That's one of his staples. Yeah, yeah, it's one of his it's one great. of his big ones. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it'll be up on iTunes very soon. Yeah, yeah have do you have a, copies? Do you um, have a date for the that when it goes up on iTunes? Or? Um, definitely in the next couple of weeks. I've only been home for like ten days, so I'm still trying to <laughs> get get all my ducks in a row after this trip. Um. But uh, I've got physical copies. If anybody <laughs> wants to email David Whitwell Trombone at gmail.com. Hold on, you don't have these on a website? I need to put them on a website. <laughs> I, I just picked up these copies like last week. Oh, okay, so okay. They're, okay. They're, fine, fine. They're fine. very fresh. They're, very fresh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're still warm, warm from the, from yeah, the pressing. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, what, you know, let's, let's, you know, I think, let's just, uh, what do you got coming up? You want to you wanna talk about plugs, you know, uh, concerts? Sure. And, yeah, 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 and yeah, a few things. Month or two. Um, yeah, uh, I play in the Eco Music Big Band, which mm-hmm. is a really wonderful, um, uh, socially forward-thinking big band uh, here in town. Um, I'm doing uh, a concerto with them uh, two nights in a row. Uh, the band leader, Maria Contrera, wrote a wonderful piece for me called Seven Generations. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, it's about the concept of, um, uh, of leaving the, the, the planet the way you found it, uh, keeping in mind seven generations ahead of you and seven generations behind you. So when the, um, when's, when's that coming up? So um, that's uh, we're doing that at Joe's Pub on August 27th, and we're Great. doing it at Zinc Bar on the 28th. Where uh, Joe's Pub is pretty familiar. Where's the other one? Uh, where's the other place? Zinc Bar is also downtown. I would have to look up the exact yeah, address. I'll put that in the intro. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah um, uh, other than those two dates, um, the Underground Brass has a season coming up. We're going to announce some concert dates pretty soon. As a group that I have, it's myself and Dave Taylor and Jay Rosen. It's a low mm-hmm. brass trio, mm-hmm. which is a really awesome instrumentation that I really believe in. Uh, so we have a, a Polish concert of all Polish composers. Um, we have the Civil Unrest Project. Um, do you have uh, do you have dates for those coming up? We don't. Have, we, we haven't confirmed all the dates yet. Great, but I'll I'll put them up on the website. Um, uh, and also, I'm curating a year worth of concerts at um, a place called Spectrum on the Lower East Side. It's one of the. Uh, it's a great place to have weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really great. It's really great. Um, yeah. So um, Jay Rosen, who is a wonderful, wonderful tubist, is going to be having his solo CD release party there mm-hmm. uh, to kick off this whole series. Um, I believe it's going to be on October third at nine o'clock. And then um, Will Lang, uh, who's a wonderful mm-hmm. experimental trombonist, yeah. uh, is going to be doing a solo recital on November the sixth. Um, and and this we'll is this is all part of what you're cur- the, your the your right, yeah. project. Yeah, it's um, I, we might call it like radical brass or mm-hmm. something like mm-hmm. that, but it's uh, innovative brass performers. Um, so in starting in January, it's going to be on the first Sunday mm-hmm. of the month at three p.m. It's going to be a Sunday afternoon in the salon. Uh, and I'm really excited to be able to present some some new stuff. Um, October 25th, uh, the New York Trombone Consort has a great show coming up at the Cathedral Basilica of St. James in Dumbo. Oh uh, yes, where you, you'll, you'll be and on I that. will be playing. Yeah, we're, we're, doing, right. a, we're <laughs> doing a double trombone consort and organ, uh, love and we're going to be swinging back and forth from. Uh, some Gabrielli and I think some Thomas Tallis as well up in the choir loft and some double choir stuff. Um, and we'll have uh, organ interludes and then we're going to be playing new pieces um, uh, spatialized around the floor of, mm-hmm. the, of the cathedral. It's a very large space. And we're going to be... And attest to the beauty of this particular cathedral. It is yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. wonderful. It's a great but you will be handed a blindfold as soon as you come to the concert. Uh, so you can. I will be, or the audience. Uh, will the be. audience oh, will okay. be. I hope I'm not being blindfolded. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, the, the audience will will be encouraged to to keep blindfolds on for the entire program. Interesting. Because um, the the sound is going to be spatialized uh, for every piece on this show. So um, and all the all the all the trombonists will be only wearing socks. Delightful. To uh, to just <laughs> keep down, keep keep the noise down. Yeah. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be really fun. I'm very excited about it. Sounds that exciting. Show. So, uh, where can uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, I'm at davidwhitwelltrombone.com. 
It's W H I T W E L L. Um, I'm not co to be confused with uh, the conductor David Whitwell, <laughs> uh, who's uh, probably the most respected wind band conductor in the world. Uh, so, so not not wind band conducting, mostly just trombone playing and and composing. Right, right. No, <laughs> no composing. Just, 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 just play. producing. Yeah, just play, yeah, playing yeah. and producing. Fair none of the, none of the My bad. I'll have to cut that out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look like an idiot. Yeah. Um, great. So, well. Great. Uh, you, how do you, how do you feel? I good? feel great. Yeah, yeah. Good? This was a really fun talk, man. Yeah, Thanks man. for having me. Thank you for letting me come out to your humble abode in Queens. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. <laughs>